Thank you for choosing CTN. And now, it's time with Herman and Sharon. I love you. Thank you for joining us. This is part two. Our special guest, Dr. Hugh Ross. Before we get into this second part of our interview, take a look at this. And what he's saying in Job 38 and 39, you think you're so smart, you've launched all this incredible civilization, that would have been impossible if I didn't give you these animals. And actually names different animals that were critical for launching human civilization. And as evidence for that, when humans moved into Australia, they killed those animals off. Notice that the Australians never got out of the Stone Age. They lacked the animals that they needed. And then God says, I've designed these animals with a motivation to serve and please you and to relate to you. But likewise, I've designed you to reach out to a higher being. Mm -hmm. So as God designed the birds and mammals to reach out and relate to us a higher species, he's designed us to relate to him a higher being. Dr. Hugh Ross, what an honor. This is part two, if they miss part one, I feel so sorry for you, I really do. I really do. So you got to stick around for part one. Okay, at least we're, we'll show you on our on our program schedule. But uh, he is just fabulous. And then I've got next to me my grandson, Justin Bailey. And he is about to leave, in fact, this week for Baylor University in Texas. And this is the subject matter that he will be studying. I mean, it is absolutely <laughs> amazing how much time he spends in listening to people like Dr. Hugh Ross, and the names just go on and on and on. I have the privilege of hearing much of it and reading the books and never realized how many years that I had been fascinated by a lot of this subject matter, and now I have a grand grandson that actually has the brain power. See, I, I didn't have that, but he's got a whole different... Uh, level of thinking than I do. When he reads a book, he actually remembers what he reads. Like this guy next to me that was lecturing in universities at age 16. Uh, that tape that we just watched, and by the way, you can have the entire, the entire DVD if you, you just saw some clips. I did it on part one and this is part two, but this is absolutely amazing. You will love it, you will enjoy it, you will learn so much as I did and you will not be able to get up until you watch the entire DVD. It's that good. And then uh, when you see the website, make sure you make available his book. And, uh, and he's got many books. But this is Navigating Genesis, what we're going to talk about today. And there it is on your screen. Go to the website. Make yourself available to all of the opportunities that you will see there. And uh, his ministry is just amazing. So you could actually... Uh, have him come to your convention, to your churches, to your universities or whatever, <laughs> if he can find it in his schedule. But anyway, but you, you will be blessed if you ever have him speak, trust me. But that particular tape, uh, I never thought Australia eliminated animals. Well, when the Aborigines came into Australia, very quickly, they wiped out about 94% of all the large body bird and mammal species. And that's why they were stuck in the Stone Age. They lacked the very animals that the book, Job tells us, are crucial for launching and sustaining civilization, like the cow, like the goat, like the horse. Uh, these are creatures that God specially designed now uh, you, for our benefit. You even take that to the place of where many atheists live where? They live in cities, and what you saw there was just a snippet of a whole book I've written, Hidden Treasures in the Book of Job, where you got Job saying, look to the birds, they'll instruct you. Look to the mammals on the field, they'll instruct you. And what I've noticed is when people are cut off from those animals, you see atheism rising. And where people have contact with those animals, like in rural settings, you know, when I go to rural Africa, everybody believes in God and it's because they're being taught by these creatures. So what I do in the book, Hidden Treasures in the Book of Job, is show you how they teach us about ourselves, about God, about sin, and our uh, need for a redeemer. These animals are there not just to provide for us physically and to help us launch civilization. They're there to teach us crucial 
have uh, spiritual lessons. And, you know, I gave an example yes. there. How, you know, obviously you see that they're highly motivated to serve and please as human beings. We're a higher species. Likewise, God designed humans to serve and please a higher being. And just like our sin damages the potential of these birds and mammals to serve and please us, so also our sin damages our potential to serve and please God. And as it takes a higher being to tame these animals, that's what you see at the end of the book of Job. Some of these animals are easy to tame like the goat, others are much more difficult like the hippopotamus. But he says there's one species of life you can't tame. You cannot bring humility to a proud human heart. Wow. It takes me to do that. So it's telling us we have to go to God for what we lack. There was something happening before the garden, right? Yes. What? Well, the next book I'm working on, it's not done yet, but I got another chapter and a half to go, is everything that must be put in place before you can have a long history of life that will provide humanity with all the resources they need and the animals are going to need to launch and sustain civilization so we can fulfill the Great Commission, bring about the end of all evil and suffering, thanks to what God does on the cross and other things, and then enter into a new creation. And I think that's crucial, that before God created his universe, he had redemption in mind. He knew that sin would come and evil would come, but he had a plan set in place to use that to bring about a much higher good. And we need to realize Christianity, unlike the other religions of the world, teaches a two-creation model. He creates this universe as a tool to bring about the end of all evil and suffering, as a segue to the new creation where evil and suffering will never exist again and our free will will actually be enhanced. I mean, that's the great paradox. We're going to enter in a new creation with a much enhanced free will, but we'll never use that free will for evil intent. Why? Because we've already gone through the present creation where we're exposed to the greatest challenge that evil can possibly present, and thanks to God's help, we pass the test. Did Adam and Eve bring all of this pain and suffering and labor that we have to do and women have to go through suffering to bear children, were they the cause of it? Well, they were in the sense that they chose uh, to disobey God, you know, and that brought about spiritual consequences which made, quote, life more difficult for us. But notice that God in advance had already established laws of physics that are optimally fine-tuned so that we can be maximally delivered from the consequences of, of suffering and evil. You know, I wrote another book on this, Why the Universe is the Way It Is, pointing out how God designs the law of gravity, the thermodynamic laws, the laws of electromagnetism, so that every time we disobey God, we experience more work, more pain, and more wasted time. So the laws of physics are actually designed to motivate us to depart from evil and pursue virtue and the process discover we need supernatural help in the process. How come we can't <clears throat> live to be age 900? Well, uh, I write about that in Navigating Genesis, yes. how certain things happen at the time of the flood that made it impossible for us to live beyond about 120 years. So was there a canopy over it so the, all of the no, the pollutants weren't there? Uh, there are many canopy theories, none of them work. And uh, so, but what I point out is that there's research done by a Russian and an, uh, a British astronomer that established that there is a supernova eruption that took place within the last 100,000 years that's responsible for more than 90% of the very fast moving heavy nuclei cosmic rays. And those are the ones that do your body the most damage. And we're having, experiencing those daily? We are. And moreover, what you see in Genesis is that until after the flood, humanity was restricted to one locale, a large sedimentary plain. And that means that there's a possibility they had no exposure to igneous rocks. Now, igneous rocks are loaded with uranium and thorium. Today, it's ubiquitous. Wherever you've got freeways, wherever you've got concrete, you're going to have exposure to these igneous rocks. But before the flood, humanity was not yet exploiting those rocks and they were constrained to sedimentary planes, which means they would have been isolated from that radiation exposure and wow. with the supernova not yet having taken place, 
they wouldn't have had to deal with the cosmic rays that we're dealing with today. Moving ahead, because we only have a half hour, yeah. what was the flood well, over I, the entire Earth? I argue that the Bible teaches that the flood was worldwide, but not global. Now, in the 21st century, people think those are both the same. They're not. The Bible describes many worldwide events that it defines as being less than the globe. So, for example, in 2 Peter, it says the world of the ungodly was flooded, or the world at the time the event took place was flooded. The fact that the Greek word cosmos is consistently paired with an adjective tells us it's not the entire globe. And all God wants with the flood is to wipe out all of reprobate humanity. Well, if reprobate humanity has not yet visited Antarctica or Greenland, there's no need to flood Antarctica or Greenland. And explains why the ice cores there show no evidence for a flood. People hadn't lived there, there's no need to flood them. Uh, God's intent was to wipe out wicked humanity and all the higher animals associated with them. So yes, it's a worldwide flood, worldwide to the world of humanity, but not global. And you can actually explicitly prove that by going to various texts that talk about creation day three, uh, where God sets up the continents for the first time, where the world is transformed from a water world to where you got oceans and continents. That's described, for example, in Psalm 104. And what it says there in verse 9, once the continents are in place, never again will water cover the face of the earth. Wow. And that's repeated five times in the Bible, that once the continents are in place, the water can never again cover the whole face of the earth. You say Job was the first book of the Bible. The content of the book of Job, you can tell from clues in the text, must have predated the Mosaic books by at least 400 years, maybe as much as 600 years. Now, that was before Hebrew was a written language. But notice the book of Job is set up as easily memorizable poetry. I believe the book of Job was preserved for hundreds of years by people memorizing it word for word until Hebrew became a written language and then it was recorded. That was God, well, it, securing that. It was, it also explains for the skeptic why Moses left out such crucial details in Genesis 1. Moses knew that people already had the content of the book of Job, so there was no need for him to repeat what they already had. And so we need to see Genesis as a complement to the much longer creation texts that are in the book of Job. Now you believe this is old earth, not young earth? Yes. Um, how do you, how do you, <coughs> because many theologians, I mean, I, I read a right. lot of magazines and a lot of controversy on this subject. How did you come to that conclusion? Well, I was 17 years of age reading Genesis and realizing that this word day right in Genesis 1 is used in three different ways. I mean, you got day and night being contrasted on creation day four. Uh, you got uh, day showing up on creation day one, a 24 hour period. Then in Genesis 2, 4, it uses the word day to refer to the entire creation week. So I so said, those are three different literal definitions used right there in the text. Later, when I looked into the Hebrew language, I discovered this word yom has four different literal definitions part of the daylight hours, all the daylight hours, a 24-hour period, or a long but finite period of time. And in biblical Hebrew, the only word you got for an epoch of time is the word yom. So it's different than English, where we got nearly a dozen words for a long period of time. And the reason I concluded these had to be six consecutive long periods of time is that there's no evening and morning for day seven. We're still in the seventh day three other places in the Bible it tells us we're currently in God's seventh day. Hebrews 4, Psalm 95, and uh, uh, John chapter 5. And then you have day 6 where God creates both the human male and the human female. But in Genesis chapter 2, we've got God creating Adam first and a long description of events that take place before Eve is created. And if you look at it, it's at least a six month period between the creation of Adam and the creation of Eve. How old are we? Uh, in terms of human beings, well, <clears throat> in Genesis 2, it talks about four rivers coming together in Eden. Two of those rivers don't flow today, and they haven't flowed in the last uh, 12,000 years. So that tells us that Adam and Eve must have been created by God sometime during the last ice age, when all four rivers would be flowing. So. 
a few tens of thousands of years ago, we have God creating Adam and Eve, and uh, you know, we're all descended from that one couple. That Why God is it created. so controversial? Old, new. Well, <clears throat> I think it dates back to the Scopes trial when evangelical Christians were embarrassed by what happened there. And so they began to treat the scientific community as an enemy to be destroyed. That's interesting. Rather than a mission field to be won. And so that's where this young earth, old earth thing had its origin. Uh, it got tied in with this global flood idea that the flood explains all the geology in the face of the earth. And it's a great way to excuse yourself from listening to what the scientists have got wow. to say. Justin, <laughs> your turn. My turn. Go any direction you Fire want. Fire any way I yeah, want. Any huh? way you want. Um, I was interested. I'm, I'm interested in how you talk about rural populations and urban populations and the different differences between belief in God and percentages and stuff like that. I would foresee a challenge by an opposition to this idea by saying the reason why this rural population still believes in God such high numbers is because they're not educated. They, they don't know science. They don't know how this all works. So it's a natural inference for them to see a higher creator as the explanation for all these things going on. Do you think that that's as good of an explanation or a plausible explanation from that side, from that perspective? I would argue that they're educated in different ways. I mean, uh, you know, certainly people living in a high-tech urban uh, setting uh, probably know a lot more about electromagnetism and uh, the, the weak and strong nuclear force and mm -hmm. people uh, that have never been to school and are living out in the countryside. Mm -hmm. But I'd argue those living in the countryside are probably far better educated on the behavior of the higher animals than those who are living in cities where the only higher animals they get to see uh, are highly domesticated dogs and cats. So it's a different kind of education. And it's the book of Job that tells us that we have a lot to learn from these animals that God created to live amongst us and to serve and please us. And what I'm encouraged by is research now being done at some of our top universities on the behavior of these higher animals, where they're now realizing that we human beings are exceptional. You know, they did experiments on dogs where they said, do dogs really experience guilt? And experiments showed, no, they're just simply reflecting what their owners want them to. So a, God, a dog will take on a guilty look if the dog <laughs> thinks that you want him to take on a guilty That's look. Interesting. That has nothing to do with their, uh, quote, bad or good behavior. And they did experiments that actually proved that it had nothing to do with the behavior. It had everything to do with the look on the human being's face. They're reflecting you. They're reflecting you. And it's, it's expressing their desire to yeah. serve and please you. Yeah. Like, you know, I've got a dog now who smiles at me. What kind of dog? Uh, it's a mix between an Akita and a German Shepherd. It's Ooh. my son's dog. That baby will nail you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, great dog. Uh, but he's now learned to smile, mainly because, you know, every time I see him, I smile. Sure. So he's reflecting that back to me. And you know, dogs will not do that in the wild. Going back to the flood. Yes. Noah walks off with his family. How is the population so huge from that point? Well, I mean, did they, <laughs> did, did they constantly... Trading, pro treading careful water. Yeah, right yeah I'm trying to think of the right word. <laughs> well, but, but was there, was there, was there, control. was there, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> but there was no birth control. But was there that possibility of that many well, keep Being in born? mind, almost all the population growth that we've seen with human beings has been in the last century. And, uh, you know, thanks to good health and, uh, you know, the possibility of people living longer, uh, you know, we've seen this population explosion. Now, there's actually trends going on where it could go the other way because technology yeah. and yeah. wealth actually lowers the birth rate. But, but, but when, when you talk about the flood, wasn't global, right? Right. I mean, we got so, eight so people there could have been there the could arc. have been thousands of people in China. Oh, no, no. No, no. Okay. No, no. I mean, if, you, if you read okay, the scripture carefully, you've got God telling Adam and Eve, multiply and fill the earth, but they don't do it. And he says to Noah when he gets off the ark, multiply and fill the earth. And so they were the again, only ones that were going to multiply and fill the earth when they yes. stepped off. When they stepped off, they, they were, were just, it. They were it, just eight people. But How do we get the slant eyes and all of the stuff that's, I mean, all the languages and all the dark skin and light skin and, and 
I mean, how do we get all of the well, variations of, of human beings? There's a chapter on that in the book. Yes. And also my colleague, Buzz Rana, our uh, uh, biochemist, actually has a whole DVD and where the racial differences come from. He makes the point, the racial differences aren't as nearly as great as we think they are. And it's relatively straightforward to start with eight people and develop those racial differences yeah, rather quickly. Yeah, you've, you've got a, a diagram, uh, as you see in the book, uh, page 126, I believe it is, where you actually show. How rapidly the population yes. can grow, right. It's an amazing graph that you've shown. Yeah. You want to talk about the movie. Oh, I was going to mention something about the movie, um, but I noticed we have a certain amount of time left, and I wanted to pursue a little bit the topic of the sources and the controversies mm -hmm. about what is Genesis actually teaching us, and what is it what is it trying to teach us? And there seems to be a growing movement, and especially evangelical. This has been around for a long time, but a growing movement in evangelical Christianity um, that's saying that Genesis one and maybe even Genesis one through eleven are more focused on being a polemic against the other Near Eastern cultures of the time and their gods and their pagan cultures to say, no, our God does it this way and our God is like this. How do you, how do you see that movement in its growing popularity? Is that a good thing? Is that a bad thing? Is well, I'm a little disturbed by it by saying that's all that Genesis is teaching. I agree with him that that is one of the purposes of the early chapters of Genesis, but it's not the only purpose. And I think what's driving this movement at seminary level is an unwillingness to integrate the book of nature with these early chapters of Genesis. So they're basically saying these early chapters of Genesis are not speaking about science, they're not speaking about nature creation. I've even run into theologians who say the word create in Genesis 1 doesn't mean create, the word, doesn't, the word make doesn't mean make, there is no scientific content there, there is no chronology. Well. I've discussed this with leading Hebrew scholars, and it's like if you look at the way the Hebrew is structured in Genesis 1, the author couldn't have tried harder to make sure that you understood this was a chronology. I mean, you got the number of days, you got the phrase, and it was so, it was good. It's basically the Hebrew author is using every tool available in the Hebrew language to say, this is an historical count, it is a chronology, these are real physical events. I think what's motivating these theologians is the fact that they're not equipped to come up with a scientific defense of the text. But when I talk to scientists, they have no problem with that. It's the theologians that have the problem with that. But the scientists say, wait a minute, uh, this is fitting beautifully. Fascinating when you talk about darkness. Bring that into where a guy like me can understand what you're talking about. Well, I mean, here you got the oldest book in the Bible, the book of Job, chapter 38, he asks the question, do you know where darkness resides? Notice that what you see there in Job is actually telling you darkness is a real substance, it's not just the lack of light, it's actually got a physical location in the universe. Well, thanks to recent discoveries, we know that Job got it right. Darkness is a real substance, there's three different forms. It's got specific geographical locations within the universe, and the quantity of the dark stuff and the placements of that dark stuff must be crucially fine-tuned if there's ever to be a possibility for life in the universe. I mean, you saw that video clip that said, if you want evidence for supernatural design, the dark stuff is where you're going to get it. Meaning, is there a, a black hole? There are lots of black holes, but black holes make up only a tiny component of the dark stuff of the universe. Okay. Now, the stuff you see out there uh, in a telescope, uh, it's 0.27 percent. 99.73 percent of the physical universe is dark energy or dark matter. What can we see in the telescope? Are we just staring at nothing? What do we actually see out there? Well, you see stars and galaxies, gas and dust. That's the 0.27 percent. But we also can see the effect of this dark matter and this dark energy and what it does to the expansion of the universe and what it does to gravitational distortion. So we're actually detecting this dark stuff for how it affects uh, gravity. And so, uh, for example, uh, if you've got a bunch of dark matter here and you have a beam of light going by it, that dark matter will bend the light according to Einstein's theory of relativity. And by measuring the bending, we can tell how much dark matter is there. And when we're looking through a telescope, are we looking at millions of years? Well, you're looking back, uh, say, at the cosmic creation event. That's you just said back. 
Well, okay, the farther away you look in, in, through your telescope, the farther back in time you're observing. Because okay. it takes like time to reach your telescope. You know, I remind my wife that as an astronomer, I'm totally ignorant of the present. <laughs> All of my data comes from the past. So, but if I look far enough away. So when we look through a telescope, <clears throat> we're looking back. You're looking back in time. So when you look at the sun, you're seeing it as it was eight minutes ago. That's how long it took the light to reach us. When you look at the Andromeda galaxy, you're seeing that galaxy as it was two and a half million years ago. Wow. But what's incredible, we now have telescopes so powerful, we can look all the way back and watch the universe being created. What? Yeah. We, we've actually got data that shows you what the universe looked like when it was a trillionth of a trillionth of a trillionth of a second old. That's so close we can get to the cosmic creation event. And I argue in my book, Why the Universe is the Way It Is, that God purposely put us here on planet Earth 13.8 billion years after the cosmic creation event because that's the epoch in which we get to observe the entire history of the universe. If God put us here any earlier, we'd only be seeing a percentage of the past history of the universe. And if you put us here later, we'd only be seeing a percentage. There's one time when you get to read the entire history book of the universe from the very beginning of the universe right up to the present moment. We're also living on the one star planet system where we get to have a clear view so that we can see everything. So God only designed the universe to give us a great place to live. He designed it so that we could read in entirety uh, the book of the universe from beginning to, to the present moment. So when he chose me before the foundation of the world, he did that with this earth at the precise time when he chose. He did, he chose the time, he chose the location, so you could read not only the entire book of scripture, you could read the entire book of nature from the very beginning of creation, right up to the present moment. The heavens declare the glory of God, the heavens declare the righteousness of God, God wanted to make sure we could see the maximum of that glory and righteousness. So he put us here at the right time and the right place, the only time and the only place. Thank you. Wow. You're welcome. Thank you. You're welcome for being here. Mm -hmm. Appreciate my buddy. Jesus Christ is the answer to every need you may have. His books, phenomenal, but they're wrapped around the Word of God, the Bible. And when you're watching this, realize that learning about what Dr. Hugh Ross has in his books will give you a greater confidence when you're talking to some individual that starts asking questions that you today may be frightened that you do not have the answer to. But this is the way you get those answers. So open your mind to things that are maybe different than you've had before. Go to that website read his books, get his DVDs, go where, where you hear him speaking, you will be blessed. God bless you. Bye-bye. Thank you for watching It's Time. If you have recently made a decision for Christ, Herman and Sharon would like to hear from you.